All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Javor, and I'm going to present a paper that emerged from my stay at the Visual Computing Institute at RWTH Aachen in Germany. Um, we are running short on time, so I'll use this as an excuse to skip over the less interesting technical details and just give you a brief overview of uh, what we did. The problem we are interested, were interested to solving is automatic shape synthesis. We imagine a scenario in which a user without modeling skills, not necessarily your grandmother, would like to download a shape from an online shape repository, um, would like to perform some mo modifications automatically, and then use the shape, the 3D model, in an unknown application. So I think it is safe to say that the general problem, problem is too complex to solve in just a single paper, and I don't expect to see a solution, um, a complete solution anytime soon. However, we believe to have made an interesting step forward and to have some insights worth sharing. The direction we decided to explore is a machine learning method for synthesis of structured shapes. We train a variational autoencoder, which is a type of neural network that in our case learns to map between a set of training samples, uh, 3D models made out of building blocks, and points in a continuous vector space or latent space. So having access to the autoencoder's latent space Ah, oh, thank you. Having access to the autoencoder's latent space after training allows to express shape synthesis operations by sampling points in the vector space and then trying to decode them to a 3D model. This allows other interesting operations like interpolating between shapes, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, later on. Of course, the general idea of applying machine learning methods for difficult problems like shape synthesis is not new, uh, and it will come uh, as no surprise that there has been a uh, quite a number of attempts to employ deep learning methods for shape modeling. And a couple of examples here um, generate what we consider uh, style variations or shapes that you can find in uh, just a few existing shape databases. As some objects like airplanes or furniture. Um, procedural modeling methods, on the other hand, um, have an advantage that they do not require as many models to, to learn from. So for a data-driven method, you will need a huge, a vast amount of models or examples to train. Um, while procedural modeling methods just assume an underlying model for creating the possible shapes. And this has, gives the advantage that you're able to learn the type of variations or the type of uh, structures that you can create from just a few examples. Um, and our methods share similarities with uh, methods from both these categories. We both have a deep learning method, but we also procedurally generate uh, training data. And the important part, um, like, well, while the reason why I'm going to bore you with uh, this presentation is that um, we are able to outperform the state of the art in the size and the complexity of the structures of the shapes we are going to generate. So one very important limitation uh, our method does not have is the reliance on a context-free or a hierarchical shape grammar to generate the shapes. Um, instead of a context-free shape grammar, we compute a little bit more general um, tiling grammar. Um, so what this means is that given an input shape, we extract a shape of rules um, that describe how the building blocks that the shape is made out of uh, are allowed to be attached locally to each other. Now in this example, um, the green tower can attach to one or two pieces because just those are the uh, configurations we have observed uh, in the input shape. And we also restrict the neighbor type. So each of the tower pieces can only attach to a wall piece. Um, and for now, these are the only rules that we extract that will describe what we consider to be a valid shape and what we consider to be an invalid shape. And you see a couple of examples on the bottom of the slide. So the variant on the left is valid, while the variant on the right has two intersecting green towers, which violates the rules of the grammar. Now, using those more general tiling shape grammar, so this simple set of rules, is very advantageous if um, 
you have an unsupervised or fully automatic method where you have to extract the rules from a given example. Um, however, it has the disadvantage that um, the grammars are non-context free. And if you have studied theoretical computer science, you will know that creating uh, words in a non-context free language is an undecidable problem. So this will make the shape synthesis much uh, more difficult. And we address the problem of shape synthesis with the core idea of our paper is shape representation uh, using strings. Um, what we do is we convert the input shape into a shape graph. We compute the contact graph of its building blocks or pieces. Uh, and then we map uh, the topology of this graph to one or multiple strings. The strings can be mapped back to 3D models. Um, in other words, we exploit this connection between formal languages and procedural modeling that is given by the grammars um, and convert uh, our 3D models into a representation that can be learned by a natural language processing uh, method. Um, I will just skip the first step of the process. So computing a shape graph uh, is uh, kind of trivial. We use uh, implement this with collision detection. You can also use proximity detection. Or if you're very lucky, this you can get a shape graph when you download the shape from um, somewhere. Um, the second part, converting a shape to string, roughly looks like that. So we first break a cycle, and then we pull the shape apart in order to order the pieces next to each other. And then we map a letter to each word with a couple of special characters that I'm going to explain. Um, the method is a generalization of smile strings. This is a system of representing um, molecule formally as text. Uh, and the definition is uh, graph-based. You first um, order the nodes uh, in the graph in the order they appear in a depth-first search. This will cover a spanning tree on the graph. Um, you have to also add special characters, in this case brackets, to decode branches. Um, and then you can close the uh, cycles by adding the remaining edges. Um, and in our case, and in the small strings conversion, we enumerated the edges and then we attached the number to next to the nodes that participate, that are connected via this edge. So what this conversion between 3D models and strings gives us is um, the possibility to use uh, natural language processing methods uh, for shape synthesis. So in, this pipe, in the first part of our pipeline, we converted a shape collection into a text database, and then we trained, uh, as I said, a recurrent variation of autoencoder. So the similar type of uh, architecture has previously, uh, has previously been shown to generate um, languages in English or molecule formally. And the important part for us is the ability of the, of the network to express a mapping between, in this case, between strings and points in a vector space and then having access to the vector space or the latent space of the neural network allows to uh, sample a new point and then try to decode it to a new string that conforms, hopefully conforms the grammar. If not, we will discard it. Now, before I explain the last part of the pipeline, namely how we convert the strings to, uh, back to 3D models, I'll have to fill in a gap that's not shown on the slide, namely how do we come up with an entire shape collection uh, having enough examples for training from a single shape we downloaded from uh, online. Uh, and the short answer is a procedural modeling method uh, or a principle first invented by Martin Bockeloch and colleagues. Um, and in our case, we have a very simple implementation of, um, uh, of this method. We start with two uh, 3D models that it can be two times the same model, and we compute their shape graphs. We then sample a random subgraph on one of the models. Um, and by attaching this subgraph to a compatible location uh, at the second shape, you can create a new variant that, um, if you're careful, does not violate any of the, of the grammar rules. So this principle is kind of simple, um, but it's very, very difficult to implement completely uh, uh, automatically. So we came up with a solution that worked uh, in uh, quite a few cases. 
uh, and we use this to generate our training data. So what we did is we just unloaded uh, meshes from public collections like Thingiverse, uh, for example, and we either se segmented uh, the models into parts or they were already segmented. Uh, we assembled two interesting starting vari variants that you see in the foreground, and then we created uh, iteratively applied this random graph sampling uh, method to create new variants until we had enough samples for, for learning. An interesting uh, side note for this model is that um, the segmentation uh, is a result uh, from another work, uh, and we started uh, with a 3D mesh without any additional information. And then we used uh, partial symmetries and an optimization technique to compute uh, the composition into building blocks. This shape, for example, this uh, is a sand castle and it was already pre-segmented, so we just assembled a couple of variants um, and then ran uh, the s random sampling. Um, this is a moon base um, uh, and it has very uh, difficult uh, structures, so the grammar rules are very restrictive, so it was very hard to generate variants. On top of that, it had quite a, a bit more triangles than what you typically see in this um, um, in the research um, for shape synthesis. So the shape in the background has the model in the background has about two and a half million triangles, which is quite a bit more than uh, you typically see. Uh, and though this example was, uh, on the contrary, very easy to uh, generate variations from, uh, and we just needed a single iteration to generate, um, uh, we just needed a couple of iterations to generate 1,000 examples that we could then convert into about 400,000 strings and used to learning. This is um, a playground model that was used in a related work that we included for comparison. Uh, and this is the last data set that we used. Uh, and it is interesting because it turned out to be more difficult to use. Uh, the reason for that is that the buildings here are made out of building blocks. Um, and each of the building blocks has uh, four neighbors. So you have twice the number of edges in the graph compared to the number of nodes. And if you remember, in our string encoding, we use special characters to denote branches and cycles. Um, and we used the, um, the neural network, so we relied on the neural network to figure out automatically or by itself that those characters have different meaning or behave in a different way uh, compared to the characters that denote nodes. Uh, this meant that we had to use much larger networks in order to train on, on this, on the strings that represented those models. So we have a couple of ideas of how to address this in the future, but the current implementation that is also an open source is not very scalable. When you increase, when you have a large number of edges in the graph compared to the number of nodes. Okay, the last piece of the puzzle is how we convert back uh, strings uh, to shapes. Um, and it's turned out to be a difficult uh, thing to solve as well. Uh, and we had to perform the, uh, our solution consists of two steps. Um, we first uh, have to augment uh, our shape grammar with what we call edge categories. Until now, for the strings, we only needed to consider the topology of the graph. So we didn't have any spatial information of how the pieces are connected. The edge categories um, describe what are the possible ways uh, to spatially attach pieces of your model together. Um, we use the generated shape collections to uh, automatically compute or to learn the uh, possible configurations. And we did this by mean shift clustering, the relative positions. Um, so the resulting configurations are on the right. So you can see the number on the right describes how many, in how many different ways piece B can be attached to piece A. Uh, and then the figure is the first piece in the middle, and then the second piece replicated at each of the allowed configurations. And note that we add these categories to the existing grammar rules. So the green tower has six possible ways to attach a wall, but it still can only attach to one or two wall pieces in order not to break the rules that we've seen, or in order not to introduce configurations we haven't seen in the input models. This guarantees that the models that we generate remain plausible uh, even though we don't have any semantic information other than the example. This is the same uh, breakdown for a different model where the relative position clusters are a bit more spread out because uh, the 
uh, 3D model was made out less carefully. So we tried to test the robustness uh, towards imprecisely placing the building blocks towards each other. Um, note that the clusters still have a very relatively good separation. So our method might will not work if you have uh, if you can position a building block at a continuous location. So if you don't have well separated clusters, we will have troubles detecting this. Assuming you don't, um, we you, what you can do to uh, instantiate the strings into graphs is to employ um, sequence to sequence encoding methods. So those are um, neural networks that are used for language translations. And what we translate in our case is the string that represents the graph topology uh, into a sequence of edge configurations. Having the edge configurations, you uniquely define the way how uh, the building blocks can be embedded in space. Now, this part of our method had a good and a bad side. So um, we had very high accuracy for our for the neural network. So the neural network predicted with uh, more than 90% accuracy the categories. However, uh, in our case, only one or two uh, wrong uh, guesses can completely break the in instancing of the shape. Um, so we had to implement, in addition to the uh, uh, to the neural network prediction, we had to implement a piece-by-piece -piece assembly method, and at each step we would check whether uh, the partial uh, shape or the partial 3D model uh, still conforms to the grammar rules uh, and does not violate them. This meant that in the end, we were not always able to instantiate strings that we generated by sampling. Um, however, given the complexity of the problem, we were happy to have discovered a method for synthesizing non-context free shapes that would work with any success rate. And in my opinion, this is the most interesting find um, of our paper. However, um, another interesting aspect of the work is uh, this continuous representation of the discrete models that is given by uh, the neural network and its latent space. Um, we explored in different opportunities of sampling or uh, in using the latent space of the autoencoder to generate models. And we started by um, sampling directly in latent space. So I will skip the less interesting point sampling or point uh, perturbations, a linear manipulation, and jump to what we called latent path sampling. We select a pair of random points in space that represent the start and end shape and then find another point in latent space that decodes to a valid string or shape, um, and it's closest to uh, both of these points. And then we recursively repeat the procedure to generate paths like that. So you can think of this as how the neural network would interpolate between the first and last shape. And subjectively, the results were not very intuitive. So if you have the first and last shape, uh, Maybe you, this is not the result that you would expect. This is how the network would structure its latent space in order to learn to decode uh, points to strings. So a more elaborate way of performing the same operation is to add a similarity metric uh, in addition to the Euclidean distance uh, in latent space. And we use this similarity metric to guide the discovery of similar examples. So we experimented with a couple of methods, and the one that work, worked best was a search graph that we constructed by using uh, Euclidean distance in latent space again to guide the graph topology. So we connected each point with its k nearest neighbors. We also connected points that represent the same shape. Um, I missed to tell you that um, the conversion between graphs and strings is not unique. So we have multiple strings representing the same graph topology. And we use this to generate more training data. So we had multiple points in latent space that would decode to strings representing the same graph topology. Um, and in the, our search graph constructions, we kind of uh, merge back those points together by connecting um, every point that would represent the same graph topology. Uh, with each other, so we had these strongly connected components there. Um, in addition to the graph topology, we also added the simple similarity metric as edge weights. Um, what we used is because we didn't have a, a example application was a, sim a simple node type histogram 
in comparison. Now, interpolating between shapes can be expressed by finding the shortest path in this search graph. And as you can see, the results deliver more intuitive or subjectively more intuitive intermediate results. So each neighboring shape has similar amount of uh, pieces and also similar structure because um, of the way we generated our training, uh, training sets. And you see several examples. I marked some of the shapes that we generated from the latent space of the autoencoder. So those were examples that were not present in the initial training set uh, and we uh, generated them by embedding them. Um, also note that the results that we obtain with this method, like the amount of variability you see in the intermediate shapes depends on uh, what you have in your training set. So if in, this is a good example, the uh, uh, interpolation, the lower row, the first two shapes differ only by a single building block because you had similar examples in your shape collections, while the other examples have exhibit more significant shape variations. And you can guide this by uh, changing your training set uh, or guiding the network. So this is not a limitation or a feature of the network that it generates larger or smaller shape variations. This is just the data that you have. And this is basically most of the interesting things that I can uh, share with you. So um, we have an open source implementation uh, available of the method. And I, if you're curious, take a look at that. Um, however, I think that um, this presentation will be more towards, uh, will be closer to uh, the research topics as opposed to the more product things that you are going, are going to see at the conference. So this is more like more what will be out there, I think, in several years, uh, but not immediately ready as product. The code is there and it works, so if you feel uh, like experimenting, just take a look and yeah, feel free to build something out of that. But it is not a product that you can have and just use uh, without putting some extra effort. Um, the interesting parts, however, are uh, or what sets this method apart from uh, what is out there already um, are the size and the complexity of the graphs and the structure of the shapes that we can uh, generate. Other methods have other advantages. For example, they can morph the individual parts. We concentrated only on generating uh, shapes with different topology uh, and different size. And we managed to generate much larger uh, shape graphs compared to what is out there. So other methods that would generate graphs that have cycles that are not tree-like uh, end up with something like eight or 10 pieces uh, while we can generate something in the order of hundreds uh, of nodes. Um, a nice trick was that we used procedural modeling to generate our training data. So we did not have to rely on huge databases. And this is something that might be useful for you as well. And um, being at the rendering conference, this is something that comes to mind that, uh, when, uh, using when, when thinking about machine learning. And, um, and the main take home point was this conversion between uh, 3D models and strings that allowed to use natural language processing methods for 3D modeling. Thank you.